And then there's a range. There's a range of beauty. Is there not lower and higher? And if they are lower and higher, you know what? We have to get people to, to, to talk about it out of their own experience. Agree? Or we're not doing anything. Well, if they are profound experience of beauty, then um, where does it come from? From the divine? Something like that? Wow, that's pretty high up. If so, then there's a primal beauty. Well, if it's a primal beauty, highest, then what is it like? And if you know what it's like, you ought to be able to say what it is. Agree? I mean, so we don't have to read Plotinus tonight. No? No. Well, what we, if we want to? Because which one of these can you speak about yourself? One or two. Which one? All of them. All of them. See that? I told you we don't need to speak about them. We don't have to read the times. I'll take them all. We don't need to read any of philosophy then. Yeah, because? Because we can talk about all of it. No, well, not we, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and to the degree that anyone wants to take any of these. Barbara, which one do you want? I, I'm, I'm, I'm mulling it over. I'll have to oh, okay. Like, you know. all, right. All, right. All, right. all right. Can we mull it over and then read Plotinus in the meantime and get back to you? And then we'll get back to Plotinus after we do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right? Okay? Because... Yeah, That's not what I said, but... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I had to make a little change. <laughs> Pierre, uh, in terms of bodily beauty, yeah, okay. Uh, one of the things that that strikes me is: Have you ever seen sculpture by Rodin? Probably not. Mm. This one? Is that the past? The thinker? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Have you ever seen sculptures by Rodin? Yes. Okay. Wonder. Especially the one he calls the poet. Mm. Mm, I'm not familiar with that one. That's the one that they mislabeled called the thinker. Yeah. Oh, that one. You know the... Originally, <laughs> the no, his title to it was the poet. Poet. Not the thinker. Oh, the okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that when I saw a lot of... And I, there's a lot of the Norton Simon in this is incidentally. Yeah. And that's where I saw quite a few of his pieces. And one of the things that struck me after looking at them for a while is his portrayal of bodily, and most of them are in the Greek tradition, they're all, you know, naked. You know, they're without clothing. Mm -hmm. and one of the things no, that struck fine. me, you know, is that the they were of a, a most beautiful nature, yet they were not what we would call Greek uh, sure. symmetry. No. But no. still, mm -hmm. when you look at them, you begin to see the radiation of that portrayal. Well, and I, then I it fits. Yeah, mm -hmm. and for me. Yeah. And so, you know, I have to think that there's got to be something else there. No. No. Besides that, no. so it can't be... If so, then we go here. Right. Higher. Right. And if this is true, we go here. Mm -hmm. 
Like the idea, the yeah. form part of yeah. Plotinus, yeah. Yeah. how form brings beauty. Yeah. Well, what about this? Think this is a fair way then to proceed? What you were reading earlier. <laughs> uh, I know what to do. Let's call on Julie to decide. Julie. Monk. Thank you. You can count on her for those. <laughs> you know, I actually. I, I was doing something else. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I've experienced divine well, beauty. I'll tell you what. Let's use the suggestion that was raised. And why don't we start with this one? Now, right. now if you like this way of approaching it, this is Plotinus's way of writing the section on beauty. Mm -hmm. This is the way he proceeds. Right. And notice he avoids all of this modern talk of who's to say what's beautiful and who is, who is not and uh, how can you possibly say it's beautiful and all of those questions. Because look at the splendid way he starts. Right. Section two. Look at it. Let us then go back to the beginning and determine what beauty is in bodily forms. <clears throat> hey, clearly, it's something detected at first glance, something that the soul remembering names, recognizes, gives welcome to, and in a way fuses with. Ah, when the soul falls in with ugliness, it shrinks back, repulses, turns away from, from it as disagreeable and alien. We therefore suggest that the soul, being what it is and related to the reality above it, ah, it's delighted when he sees any signs of kinship or anything that is akin to itself and takes its own to itself and is stirred to a new awareness of whence and what it really is. All right. Does that describe what beauty is? Does that match it? When you see something unexpectedly beautiful, is that what happens? Mm -hmm. Then he's captured a universal experience, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ugliness, too. And of ugliness. Whatever it is that you're going to call one or the other. Mm -hmm. Ah. But what page is that on? That's on page 35. Um, oh. It's between um, you know, 35 and 37. Okay. How's that? Very accurate. Yes, because it starts on 35 and I went to 36. <laughs> is that right? Come on, you got well, to mature? The fact is that. We'll look here and see. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. But, hey, from that he says, you know what? Now he jumps directly here at anticipation, see? Then he backs away from it. But he quickly makes a move from bodily beauty to the intellectual, see? Notice the way he does it. Hey, is there any similarity between loveliness here below and that of the intelligible realm? If there is, then the two orders will be in this alike. Oh, right. something about them that is alike. Find some common, see that? Huh? What can they have in common? Beauty here and beauty there. I'll tell you what it is. 
there the shares and the same idea. Capital I. They both share. See? So he moves quickly from bodily beauty in one paragraph, anticipates the next section, and finds a commonness between the two, something alike. And now he then takes the other side, the negative, the ugliness. Look here. <clears throat> as long as any shapelessness that admits of being patterned in shape does not share in reason or in idea, it continues to be ugly and foreign to that above it. It is utter ugliness, since all ugliness comes from an insufficient mastery by form and reason. Matter, not yielding at every point to formation in accord with idea. Notice now, when idea enters, see, when idea enters in, when idea enters in, it groups, arranges what from the manifold of parts becomes a unit. Contention transforms into collaboration, making the totality one coherent harmoniousness. Because idea is one. And one as well must be the being it informs. Hey, and one as well must be the being it informs. See, look here. <laughs> he's giving it, he's giving it power. He's giving it existence. He's giving a power to enter in into the lower realm. And he, not only that, it's akin to what he calls reason. And, you know, any lump of anything, when you start, um, you chip away here, chip away there until the form emerges, right? Until the form emerges. What are you bringing out? You're bringing out an idea mm. to the degree that the material resists it, then you're using the wrong material. But if not, your skill has to be used to just take this out, that out, this out, Right, smooth it out until finally you have what you want. It's an idea. In what is thus compacted to unity, ah, it's beauty resides right there. Present to the parts, to the whole. And what is naturally unified, its parts become all alike. Beauty is present to the whole. Thus, there is the beauty craftsmanship confer upon a house, let us say, and in all its parts. And there's beauty, right? There is the beauty some natural quality may give to a single stone, right? That's right. Now, every one of these now, you can see how he builds. So you can see how he builds. When he talks about this, he's going to anticipate this. When he talks about this, he's going to anticipate this. The whole thing. The whole thing. You know what? That's what it is. It itself is a work of beauty. So you're going to pick up, pick up this idea, idea with a capital I, <clears throat> and now we're going to apply it. Right? Look how simple he starts. 
the beauty then of bodily forms comes about in this way. He's going to tell you. Hey, tell you what. It comes about in this way. It's communion with the intelligible realm. Ah. Ah. Communion, bringing together into a unity. See? It's communion. It's communion with the higher, with the intelligible. Hey, you know what? Either the soul has a faculty that is particularly sensitive to this beauty, one incomparably sure it recognizes what's akin to it, while the entire soul concurs, or the soul itself reacts without intermediary, affirms a thing to be beautiful as it finds it conform, concordant with its own inner idea. Should use this as a canon of, of accuracy. Hey, where's that idea? Also, in us. Oh, symmetry. Oh, symmetry. Balance, perfection, order, themes, balance, right? All of this. It's in the, all of this together. See? That's an idea. That has existence. Has existence. And the particular idea we're going to be talking about is beauty. What's the, what's the significance of these two differences? I mean, one one has a faculty, and yet one is. Did you hear that? What? I didn't hear that. Did you hear that? I don't. I don't see the difference. Actually, well, one is. I want to see what on, the on, what's what's the significance between these you two. Tell me. Come on, you, you, you see well, it. I don't really well, see. Well, try it. Come on. Well, as I'm reading this, one has a. It says there the soul has a faculty that is peculiarly sensitive to beauty. Okay, but then down here it says here that the soul reacts without that. I take it faculty, but it has an inner. Idea. Okay, how is that different than having its own faculty? Is it either or? Yeah. Well, okay, does one have an intermediary? Well, it sounds like the faculty is the intermediary in one. So, yes. If it has a faculty, if it uses something, then it has an intermediary. Right. If it has an intermediary, then it's not correct. Okay. Which is it? And for him. Okay, I guess I... I uh, all right, I think I understand. Okay. Okay, now watch. This is where glasses. he has... Pardon me? He either needs glasses or it doesn't need glasses. Because <laughs> the experience is immediate without the glasses. The inner idea conforms with outer beauty without any meaning. Bing! <laughs> no intermediary. <laughs> Bing! I like it. Bing! <clears throat> right. It's essential. Right? The more beautiful, the more boom it has. Right? Now look at the example he gives now, the architect. And we, we need to... Uh, I'm working too much. It's it's out of my style here. Someone else should read. Who do you think should read? Uh, the one who wants to. Who's that? This one here. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, go for it. Come on, go for it. All right. Where are we? What, what, what accordance? Yes, yes. What accordance can there be between the bodily and the prior to the bodily? That is like asking on what grounds an architect. 
Picture the architect, okay? Go ahead. That is like asking on what grounds an architect who has built a house in keeping with his own idea of a house says that it is beautiful. Is it not that the house, aside from the stones, is inner idea stamped upon outer material, unity manifest in diversity? When one discerns in the bodily the idea, capital I, that binds and masters matter of itself formless and indeed recalcitrant to formation, and when one also detects an uncommon form stamped upon those that are common, then at a stroke one grasps the scattered multiplicity, gathers it together, and draws it within oneself to present it there to one's interior and indivisible oneness as concordant, congenial, a friend. Right, is that great? Yeah. At a stroke. Right, doesn't need to, he, yeah. he's describing it, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, he's getting you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The procedure is not unlike that of a virtuous man recognizing in a youth tokens of a virtue that is in accord with his own achieved goodness. The beauty of a simple... Now, wait a minute, okay? This paragraph is loaded <clears throat> because this is one of the greatest paragraphs because he's going to tell you what an idea is. Right? Therefore, it's not what you think it is. Thank goodness. Otherwise, what the heck do you want to read it if you already know it? Gray, agree? Yeah. And if it's better, and it better be better than what we think, otherwise, we wasted our money on Friday it. Friday night. Yeah, oh. okay, all right. The beauty of a simple color is from form, reason and the idea, an invasion of incorporeal light, overwhelm the darkness inherent in matter. That is why fire glows with a beauty beyond all other bodies, for fire holds the rank of idea in their regard. Always struggling aloft, this subtlest of elements is at the last limits of the bodily. It admits no other into itself, while all bodies else give it entry. It is not cooled by them, they are warmed by it. It has color primally, they receive color from it. It sparkles and glows like an idea. Bodies unable to sustain its light cease being beautiful because they thus cease sharing the very form of color in its fullness. Okay. Right. What is it he just described? Fire, an idea. <laughs> the analogy of fire to idea. Idea as an invasion of incorporeal light. Yeah, sometimes called a form or an idea. What's it like? Light. What Being kind? Being pervaded by body, bodiless light. I like it more. Mm. <clears throat> Being. Overwhelmed, it sounds. Overwhelmed. Mm. Mm. See, it's like fire. Okay, so stay with that image, and everything he says about fire, you're going to say about idea on a more elevated and profound level, are you not? Okay. Yeah, do it, Barbara. Well, then, idea would glow with the beauty beyond all other, for idea holds a high rank always struggling aloft, well, fire is like an idea insofar as fire struggles aloft, one assumes fire would be aloft, and fire is the last limits of the bodily, which would mean that therein lies its similarity to idea. Hmm. Well, it admits no other into itself, so or, it has to be pure. Or it, it's the last element that can be participated. By the That's right. Yeah. It has a relationship to other bodies. Right. Right. So that holding rank is holding the rank Most of idea primary. in that regard in, in respect to the relationship of fire to all other bodies. Right. But you want to make a point about idea. Right? Well, no, no, no. What I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is with the, like you brought up holding rank, high rank. But the full quote is holding high rank in the regards to other bodies, all other bodies. So he gets the whole idea as participatory model with that with that one line and then continues the uh, no other body has the given light too as well so that's that pushes it a lot yeah look at this I don't know I didn't get that the connection between the conclusion you made he's still he's still going back and forth so he's part of this whole description still of going back and forth so what is this idea beauty it sparkles and glows. Mm -hmm. 
It's a pretty interesting notion of an idea, is it not? Look her. Look what it does. It has power. It sparkles and glows. And notice then, whatever has it must sustain it. It must be able to sustain it for as long as it has the beauty it has. That's rather curious. When it ceases sharing in it, uh, ugliness begins. Would you not agree that's a rather different way of looking at the idea of beauty? It has the power. It's a thing. It exists. It has an existence. So, would you not agree we should get some create a person to draw this idea of beauty and put into it something that mm. sparkles and glows. It's got power. It's got a generative force. Things can share in it to the degree that it shares in it, to the degree that they sustain it, they have it, to the degree they can sustain it and hold on to it, they are beautiful. And when they cease sharing in it, they fall away from it. <laughs> That's what he calls the idea of beauty. Hmm. So, hey, in the realm of sound, unheard harmonies create harmonies. Hmm. In the realm of sound, unheard harmonies create harmonies we hear because they stir to an awareness of beauty by showing it to be the single essence in diversity. Right? One and many. Same and other. <laughs> the measures in music, you see, are not arbitrary. Uh -uh. But fixed by the idea right, whose office is the mastering of matter. Ah, this will be enough for the sense realm. Because their beauty is more lofty than these. See what he's doing? All right. More lofty. Well, if they are more lofty, yeah. what's that to us? Yeah. Hmm. These go together, four and five. Okay? Wow. Hey, their beauty's more lofty than these, imperceptible to sense. That the soul without aid of the sense perceives and proclaims. To perceive them, you know what you got to do? Got to go higher, leaving sensation behind. Now, you know what? It's impossible to talk about bodily beauty. If one like uh, if one's born blind, has never seen and known bodily beauty. In the same way, it's impossible to talk about the luster of right living and learning of the like, if, if one has never cared for such things, you know, never been concerned with the face of justice and temporal. Seeing of this sort, that's not done with the eyes, it's done with the eye of the soul. And so seeing, wonder, go, wonder undergoes a joy. Wonder, distress, more deep than any, any other is one touches truth. <clears throat> Such emotion all beauty must induce an astonishment, a delicious wonderment, a longing, a love, a trembling. It's all delight. May be felt for things invisible, quite as <coughs> for things you see. Oh, you know, the soul does feel it. 
All souls, they feel it. <coughs> but souls that are apt for love feel it uh, especially. Yeah, bodily beauty. All perceive it. But uh, not everyone is stung sharply by it. Only those who are called lovers. <coughs> Therefore, you know what? It's time. These lovers of beauty beyond the realm of sense must be made to declare themselves. Okay? Time's up now, okay? All right? Speak up. <laughs> Tell us who you are. <laughs> Line up. <laughs> Eloquent speeches, well-worded, well-rounded, and expressing the essence of what you've experienced. Yes. Here, I'll start off. Uh, <laughs> Plotinus. <laughs> Go ahead. Want to jump in? Sure. Go ahead. These lovers of beauty beyond the realm of sense must be made to declare themselves. What is your experience in beholding beauty in actions, manners, temperate behavior, and all the acts and intents of virtue? Or the beauty in souls? What do you feel when you see that you are yourselves all beautiful within? What is this intoxication? This exaltation, this longing to break away from the body and live sunken within yourselves. All true lovers experience it, but what awakens so much passion? It is not shape or color or size. It is the soul itself colorless, and the soul's temperance, and the hueless luster of its virtues. In yourselves or others you see largeness of spirit, goodness of life, chasteness, the courage behind a majestic countenance, gravity, the self courage the self respect that pervades a temperament that is calm and at peace and without passion and above them all you see the radiance of the intelligence diffusing itself throughout them all they are attractive they are lovable why are they said to be beautiful because clearly they are beautiful and anyone that sees them must admit that they are true realities what sort of realities beautiful ones but reason wants to know why they make the soul lovable wants to know what it is that, like a light, shines through all the virtues. Let us take the contrary, the soul's varied ugliness, and contrast it with beauty. For us to know what ugliness is, and why it puts in its appearance, may help us attain our purpose here. Take then an ugly soul, it is dissolute, unjust, teeming with lust, torn by inner discord, beset by craven fears and petty envies. It thinks indeed, but it thinks only of the perishable and the base. In, in, in everything perverse, friend to filthy pleasures, it lives a life abandoned to bodily sensation and enjoys its depravity. Ought we not say that this ugliness has come to it as an evil from without, soiling it, rendering it filthy, encumbering it with turpitude of every sort, so that it no longer has an activity or a sensation that is clean? For the life it leads is dark with evil, sunk in manifold death. It sees no longer what the soul should see. It can no longer rest within itself but is forever being dragged towards the external, the lower, the dark. It is a filthy thing, I say, born every which way by the allurement of objects of sense, branded by the bodily, always immersed in matter and sucking matter into itself. In its trafficking with the unworthy, it has bartered its idea for a nature foreign to itself. If someone is immersed in mire or daubed with mud, his native calmliness disappears. All one sees is the mire and mud with which he is covered. Ugliness is due to the alien matter that encrusts him. If he would be attractive once more, he has to wash himself, get clean again, make himself what he was before. Thus we would be right in saying that ugliness of soul comes from its mingling with, fusion with, collapse into the bodily and material. The soul is ugly when it is not purely itself. It is the same as with gold that is mixed with earthy particles. If they are worked out, the gold is left, and it is beautiful, separated from all that is foreign to it. It is gold with gold alone. So also the soul, separated from the desires that come to it from the body, with which it has all too close a union, cleansed of the passions, washed clean of all that embodiment has daubed it with, withdrawn into itself again. At that moment, the ugliness which is foreign to the soul vanishes. Okay, look, if you want to continue this fifth theme, Skip this paragraph, go to the next one. See, when purified, so he picks up this idea, when that's accomplished, right, to keep the idea going, 
purified. God, jump down, thank you. Purified the soul is holy idea and reason. That's it. It becomes right, right, right. major point. Purified the soul is holy entirely idea and reason. Right. Therefore, if this is what we're calling soul, I mean, this is what we're calling idea, and this is soul, what state is the soul in? Ident identity. No. Reason. No, keep going. It becomes wholly free of the body, intellective, entirely of that intelligible realm whence comes beauty and all things beautiful. Beautiful. The more intellective it is, the more beautiful it is. Intellection and all that comes from intellection is for the soul a beauty that is its own and not another's, because then it is that the soul is truly soul. That is why one is right in saying that the good and the beauty of the soul consists in its becoming godlike. Because from the divinity all beauty comes, and all the constituents of reality. Beauty is genuine reality, ugliness its counter. Beauty is genuine reality. The nature of reality is beauty itself. Symposium calls it the perfection of beauty. So if one grasps the nature of ultimate reality, wow man, how <laughs> is beauty that is, right? Full of beauty, radiance, right? The reason. Sparkles. Close. Right. And the longer you stay with it, you got it. To the degree that it slips, you see sharing in the experience. So we keep going. Uh, let's see. Beauty is genuine reality. Ugliness is counter. Ugliness and evil are basically one. Goodness and beauty are also one, or if you prefer, the good and beauty. Therefore, the one same method will reveal to us the beauty good and the ugliness evil. First off, beauty is the good. From the good, the intelligence draws its beauty directly. The soul is, because of the intelligence, beautiful. Other beauties, those of action or behavior, come from the imprint upon them of the soul, which is author too of bodily beauty, a divine entity and a part, as it were, of beauty. The soul renders beautiful to the fullness of their capacity all things it touches or controls. Therefore must we ascend once more towards the good, towards there where tend all souls. Anyone who has seen it knows what I mean in what sense it is beautiful. As good it is desired and towards it desire advances. But only those reach it who rise to the intelligible realm, face it fully, stripped of the muddy vesture with which they were clothed in their descent just as those who mount to the temple sanctuaries must purify themselves and leave aside their old clothing and enter in nakedness, having cast off in the ascent all that is alien to the divine. There, one in the solitude of self beholds simplicity and purity, the existence upon which all depends, towards which all look, by which reality is, life is, thought is. For the good is the cause of life, of thought, of being. Seeing with what love and desire for union one is seized, what wondering delight, if a person who has never seen this hungers for it, has, as for his all, one that has seen it must love and reverence it as authentic beauty, must be flooded with an awesome happiness, stricken by a salutary terror. Such a one loves with a true love, with desire of that flame. All other loves than this he must despise, and all that once seemed fair he must disdain. Those who have witnessed the manifestation of divine or supernal realities can never again feel the old delight in bodily beauty. What then are we to think of those who see beauty in itself, in all its purity, unencumbered by flesh and body, so perfect is its purity that it transcends by far such things of earth and heaven? All other beauties are imports, are alloys, they are not primal. They come, all of them, from it. If then one sees it, the provider of beauty to all things beautiful, while remaining solely itself and receiving nothing from them, what beauty can still be lacking? This is true and primal beauty that graces its lovers and makes them worthy of love. This is the point at which is imposed upon the soul the sternest and uttermost combat, the struggle to which it gives its total strength in order not to be denied its portion in this best of visions, which to attain is blessedness. Okay. Now, seven, you can pull out his whole metaphysics. What we just read, you can pull out his whole metaphysics. Uh, the one who does not attain to it is... Hold it. Okay, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, would you agree the opening paragraph after the introduction is purification again? The language of the history. I'm about four lines from the bottom of page 40. But cast all everything that is alien, what follows? There one, in the solitude of self, beholds simplicity and purity, the existent upon which all depends, towards which all look, and by which reality is, life is, thought is. Hey, that's rather interesting. <coughs> What did you just say? Come on, what did you, what <coughs> did you just say? Triad. Suspended from the good. Isn't he talking about the experience of the one? The good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Being there with the good. He beholds simplicity and purity, mm. and whatever that is, it's that upon which all depends, therefore all depends upon that, whatever it is. Reality is. Towards which all look, by which there's a very source in, therefore it's the source of reality, life, what? See what he's doing? Thought. Life. Intellect. Intellect, frame of thought. Or intellect. Being life, intellect. What? It's the source of all this. Uh, another way of putting it, of course, is being vitality and intelligence. Then he labels it. You know what this is? The good. For all people desire the good. The highest good is the very nature of the source of reality, vitality, and intelligence. Yeah. For the good is the cause of life, of thought, of being. Seeing, hey, seeing, wow. What love and desire for union one is seized. What wondering delight, right? This is bliss. Right, that's bliss. One that has seen it must love and reverence it as authentic beauty. Right. Mm. Authentic beauty, beauty itself. Must be flooded with an awesome happiness, stricken by a salutary terror. Such a one loves with a true love, desires that flame. Other loves secondary. What's he called? He calls it the primal. That's the primal beauty. Well, how do you get it? Hey, how do you get it? What do you have to do to get it? Thank goodness we have another paragraph. Right. Ah. Can I finish the, the Yes, please. The one the one who does not attain it to it is life's life. unfortunate. Life's unfortunate. Not the one who has never seen beautiful colors or beautiful bodies or has failed of power and of honors and of kingdoms. He is the true unfortunate who has not seen this beauty and he alone. It were well to cast kingdoms aside and the domination of the entire earth and sea and sky, if by this spurning one might attain this vision. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's the negative side, isn't it? Yeah. yeah good. Barbara? How about jumping? Okay. What is this vision like? 
How is it attained? How will one see this immense beauty that dwells, as it were, in inner sanctuaries and comes not forward to be seen by the profane? Let him Here's the process, all right? This is the meditation. Let him who can arise, withdraw into himself, forego all that is known by the eyes, turn aside forever from the bodily beauty that was once his joy. He must not hanker after the graceful shapes that appear in bodies, but know them for copies, for traceries, for shadows, and hasten away toward that which they bespeak. For if one pursue what is like for if one pursue what is like a beautiful shape moving over water, is there not a myth about such a dupe, how he sank into the depths of the current and was swept away to nothingness? Well, so too, one that is caught by material beauty and will not cut himself free will be precipitated, not in body, but in soul, down to the dark depths loathed by the intelligence, where, blind even there in hates, he will traffic only with shadows, there as he did here. Let us flee then to the beloved fatherland. Here is sound counsel. But what is this flight? How are we to gain the open sea? For surely Odysseus is a parable for us. Here, when he commands flight from the sorceries of a Circe, or a Calypso, being unwilling to linger on for all the pleasure offered to his eyes and all the delight of sense that filled his days. The fatherland for us is there whence we have come. There is the father. What is our course? What is to be the manner of our flight? Here is no journeying for the feet. Feet bring us only from land to land. Nor is it for coach or ship to bear us off. We must close our eyes and invoke a new manner of seeing, a wakefulness that is the birthright of us all, though few put it to use. Yeah. Nice piece of work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, then, uh, what is this inner vision? Like anyone just awakened, the soul cannot look at bright objects. It must be persuaded to look first at beautiful habits and the works of beauty, produced not by crafts <coughs> and skill, but by the virtue of men known for their goodness. Then the soul of those who achieve beautiful deeds. Now look here. How can one see the beauty of a good soul? Hey, you know what? Quit drawing to yourself and take a look. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't see it, you know what you ought to do? Do as a sculpture does. Right? Do as the sculpture of a statue that is to be beautiful. He cuts away here, he smooths it there. He makes this line lighter, the other one purer, until he disengages beautiful liniments, liniments in the marble. Do you do this? Right? <laughs> Do you this, too. Cut away, you know, all that's excessive. Straighten out all that's crooked. Bring light to all that is overcast. Labor to make all one radiance of beauty. Hey, never cease. Working at the statue until there shines out upon you, from it, the divine sheen of virtue, until you see perfect goodness firmly established and stainless shrine. Hey, have you come like this? Mm -hmm. To see yourself abiding within your soul? In pure solitude? Does nothing now remain to shatter that interior unity? Nor anything external cling to your authentic soul? Hey, are you entirely that soul true light? Which is not contained by space, not confined in any circumscribed form not diffused as something without form or term, but unmeasurable, Ever. greater than all measure, more than all quantity. Do you see yourself in that state? Then you become vision itself. Be of good heart. 
remaining there, you've ascended the loft. You don't need a guide. No, no longer. Strain. Take a look. See. Only the mind's eye can contemplate this mighty beauty. But if it comes to contemplation, purblind with vice, impure, weak, without strength to look upon brilliant objects, eh, you know what, it sees nothing. Even if it's placed in the presence of an object that can be seen. Here's his principle. But the eye must be adapted to what is to be seen. Have some likeness to it if it would give itself to contemplation. No eye that has not become like unto the sun will ever look upon the sun. Nor will any that is not beautiful look upon the beautiful. Let one therefore become godlike and beautiful who would contemplate the divine and the beautiful. Now, go ahead. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> so ascending, the soul will become first to the intelligence. Survey all the beautiful ideas therein. Will avow their beauty, for it's by these ideas that there comes all beauty else, by the offspring and the essence of the intelligence. Now, look here, what is beyond the intelligence we affirm to be the nature of good, radiating beauty before it. See that? That's where he puts it. What's beauty? Radiating before the good. Sometimes called the vestibule of the good. Thus, in some, one would say that the first hypothesis is beauty. But if one would divide up the intelligibles, one would uh, distinguish beauty which is the place of the ideas from the good that lies beyond the beautiful and is its source and principle. Otherwise, one would begin by making the good and beauty one and the same principle. In any case, it is in the intelligible realm that beauty dwells. <laughs> nice piece of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, now there's a move in uh, California schools to bring this into the 10th grade of all high schools. Excellent. Well, that answers. Who's spearheading that movement? David. Mark. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Look That's at David. Right. <laughs> no, it's true. That's exactly when they start asking, Mr. Coe, why don't you talk more about philosophy? Yeah. About the 10th grade. Well, lay it out. Say, hey, guys, let me upset everybody in the class. It speaks to that question on education you brought up last Pardon? week. It speaks to that question on education you brought up last week. Like, what's wrong with education these days? That's simple. It's not educating. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. What do you want to call it? What's the end result of education? Answers. Uh, cancer. <laughs> right. Cancer. Cancer. <laughs> cancer. I think, I thought, answer. What? No, that's right. We said you become an engineer. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Or that's directed towards producing engineers. That's true. What if it turns out that every cancer patient has a conflict with philosophy and their mind? It's the answer cancer. My mom had cancer. She had chemotherapy. Be pretty good, wouldn't it? Well. Goes into remission. She seemed to have kicked it. Well, we got nothing to do tonight. I told you, this is a very simple one. You know, I was reading oh, I that on the East one. Coast in the high schools, there's a big resurgence of Greek in the high schools. Greek. Greek. I just talked to the college president, Golden West College, and I told him to put Greek on the, on the program. Oh, good. And he's a good guy. I'm going to follow it up. Good. I told him, I know, you know, the old statement, if you rub two, two Greeks together, out comes a Platonist. <laughs> no, is that Boy Scouts? Rub two plants together, you get a fire. Something like that. I always get these statements mixed up. <laughs> but I hope, I hope that's what happens. The vegetable is here.
like the language of the mysteries in chapter seven. Recognize Christmas gift. Yeah. Oh yeah. This would be good. Well. Hmm. You know what? We need something simple. Therefore, let's do the next one next time. Intelligence, ideas, and being. Right? Leave it open. What else do you want to talk about, Barbara? Cool. I don't have another wish right now. That sounds good to me. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hold it. I have a question. You know, in my psychology class, I like to introduce the students to philosophy that talks about the soul. So they see what philosophy is in contrast to what psychology covers. Do you think this would be a good introduction to the soul? No. What do you think would be better? Um, they first have to see that there's no difference between what psychology says soul is and what psychology says the psyche is. It is psychology, isn't it? It's yeah. study of the soul. Mm -hmm. Well, the last part of Book One in Plato's Republic you know, describes the soul. Okay. You recall it? Uh, um, somewhat. Well, okay, then it's enough. I'll check it out. Oh. By the way, how did you get here? <laughs> I got here because yeah. I commanded myself to Just get moving. <laughs> oh, is that enough? Yeah. Um, Just command yourself? Well, I had a plan. I knew where I was going. Oh. And what else? And I was... Wow. Um, yeah, I wanted to be here. Mm. Because... because. Um, so I could have this conversation. Because she cared. Because I cared. Yeah. Those are the elements mm -hmm. that Plato describes as the essential True. elements of the nature of the soul. Okay. What is it in you that plans, mm -hmm. that wills, and seeks to benefit yourself? Mm -hmm. As they put those three things together, that's what they mean by soul. Without calling whether it's mortal or immortal or anything else. Right. Not within you that does that. That's the first definition. Isn't that what you guys say? <laughs> well, um, I, we could if I framed it in those terms. Yeah. yeah. So, so Julie Hoygaard brings it in. That's what we do. Well, the planning, planning, creating plans. What do you, what would you call that? Um, Under learning. Motivational study. Come on, yes or no? Yeah, it's um, anticipation. Um, and, uh, oh, oh, I see. Motivation, being motivated. Yeah. To improve yourself. Is not that, that Maslow's highest principle? Right. Yeah. Well, you got it. And oh, so you can yeah. tie, tie it to what they're doing. Yeah, I just. You're, you're already to. doing it. Look, that's another public. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. Oh. Then run. <laughs> yeah. Then run. <laughs> <laughs> or don't, then write a new textbook. The, don't tell the head of your department you did or it. Or write a new <laughs> textbook. That's right. No. <laughs> Do you guys ever get beer anymore? Do I think we'll ever get that? <laughs> ever get beer? <laughs> did you hear what? Where's beer? Where's beer? Where's beer? Where's beer? Where's beer? Where's beer? Beer? No. Cervezas. What is it? Beer. beer. Oh. B E E R. <laughs> in the refrigerator. Now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, but can it's I, a good beer. Hold on, Barbara. I just need to make this number so, one more time because Rod, Rod compelled me that I make his announcement, which is not everybody was here, but.